Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to continue talking about Bill C-10. In particular, I want to discuss the updated charter statement and see if that addresses any of the concerns. I also want to talk about VPNs because a lot of people have said, well, this is not going to be a big deal. I'll just get a VPN. And it's more complicated than that. Let's have a look here at what this says. So Bill C-10, uh, the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage, the committee, is studying Bill C-10, an act to amend the Broadcasting Act. During the committee's clause-by-clause -clause consideration of the bill, an issue was raised about the potential effect on freedom of expression under the Charter, a proposed amendments to the bill that could affect programs uploaded by users of social media. So they're referencing the fact that there has been a political firestorm around this, because when they say it could affect programs uploaded by users of social media, no, it's not could, it's will and is intended to affect programs uploaded by users of social media. So there's no, this could affect them, it's this will affect them, that is what they're trying to do. Section 4.2 of the Department of Justice Act requires the Minister of Justice to prepare a charter statement for every government bill to help inform public and parliamentary debate on government bills. A charter statement with respect to Bill C-10 was tabled in the House of Commons on November 18th, 2020. In keeping with their purpose, charter statements are drafted at a high level and set out in plain language and in an accessible way potential effects that a bill may have on rights and freedoms guaranteed by the charter. Charter statements do not provide a legal opinion as to those effects. Charter statements also explain considerations that support the constitutionality of the bill. Now this is complicated, but it does help explain what a charter statement is. Charter statement comes from the Minister of Justice. Does the Minister of Justice want to undermine their own party's bills, or do they want to support them? They kind of want to support them, right? This is not an unbiased legal opinion, and it doesn't pretend to be a legal opinion. This is not something that tells you sort of the straight facts. This is something intended to say, here is why we don't think this violates the Charter. This is marketing, not legal analysis. So be aware of that whenever you get these charter statements is that they will always puff up and support the government and say, we don't think this is going to be a problem. But this is not the same opinion you'd get from if you hired a lawyer to review this and said, you know, I need an unbiased legal opinion as to whether this violates the charter. This is a political statement. So when you see media sort of uncritically accepting this, or when you see politicians saying, well, we did another charter statement and it says it's fine. Well, yes, it's basically the government who wants this bill says that the bill is fine. Um, unsurprising, right? So take charter statements with a grain or perhaps a kilogram of salt. So proposed amendments to Bill C-10. Bill C-10, as tabled in the House of Commons on November 3rd, 2020, includes a provision in Clause 1 stating that users of social media services who upload programs for sharing with other users are not affiliated with the service provider would not be subject to broadcast regulation in that respect. A program means audio, visual, or audiovisual content that is intended to inform, enlighten, or entertain, but it does not include content that is predominantly textual. So... They're saying that the users aren't going to be regulated. However, we'll see that that's not actually accurate when we get down to it. So the bill is also included in Clause 3, Section 4.1, provisions that excluded from the application of the Act programs that are uploaded to an online undertaking that provides a social media service by an unaffiliated user of that service, and two, an online undertaking whose broadcasting consists solely of such programs. So what we can see here is that there's a distinction. There's the Section 2 provision that says that users aren't subject to regulation, and that's staying in. But however, they're saying that the actual you know, programs, the things that you upload, are subject to regulation. Well, that is kind of a distinction without much of a difference when you get right down to it, because the question of... You know, are they regulating me or are they just regulating the program whereby, you know, things come up ends up not mattering all that much. If you think about it like this, let's say you want to communicate a message to people and you go to, you know, use a photocopier. You're relying on that photocopier to get the message out. If the government says, we don't like your message, you're not allowed to use the photocopier. They're censoring you in that sense. So when they make this distinction, it's not going to be all that, uh, all that effective. We'll actually see some specific examples of that as we go.
So they say Clause 3 was not carried during clause-by-clause -clause consideration of the bill by the committee on April 23rd, 2021, which means that they took it out. They say not carried. They eliminated that, uh, that clause. The effect of the proposed removal of Clause 3 is that an online undertaking that provides a social media service could be subject to regulation under the Act in respect of the programs uploaded by its unaffiliated users. However, Clause 1, Section 2, 2.1 remains. This means that unaffiliated users of social media services would not be subject to broadcasting regulation in respect of the programs they post. Again, we'll see how this is a distinction without a difference. The government has proposed amendments to Bill C-10 that would limit the ability of the uh, CRTC to regulate an online undertaking that provides a social media service in respect of programs posted by its unaffiliated users. In this respect, the Commission's regulatory powers would be limited to only the following discrete matters, and these requirements could only be imposed upon the social media service, not on its unaffiliated users. Again, we're going to see how that's a bit of uh, a bit of BS. Now, they say proposed amendments here. We'll see as to whether this is actually, you know, what goes through when they hammer this bill through, because I, I suspect that the government is going to do their best to hammer this through. Uh, because it benefits people who have more power than the average sort of YouTube commenter. So the imposition of expenditure requirements, for example, paying into funds to support, promote, and train Canadian creators, and to support the creation of Canadian programming for broadcast by broadcast undertakings, including online undertakings, and fees that relate to the recovery of the cost for the Commission's activities under the Act. So basically, they want to go to YouTube and various other places and sort of jingle their purse and say, we want money pay up. So this is effectively a giant taxation provision. But when you think about where that money is going to come from, well, it's not, you know, it doesn't come from magic. It's going to come from the creators who are posting things up, and it's going to come from the users of those services. Now, requirements in respect of the discoverability of Canadian creators, so that Canadian creators and their programs may be more easily discovered, prominently displayed, and promoted online. I previously did a video talking about how this is not actually going to do what people think or might think that it's going to do. Because most Canadian creators, these small-time Canadian creators, people who are just uploading things, either because they're doing it for their own personal things, you know, it's this is my dog video, or because they're, you know, involved in a business. There's plenty of Canadian creators now who have managed to make this into a business. And plenty of them who are surviving entirely on those funds but most of them are not going to be able to meet the requirements necessary to be designated as canadian content i talked about that in my previous video go check it out if you haven't so when they say uh you know the discoverability of canadian creators they don't mean people like me or other small youtubers what they mean is people who are basically much more major studios so when they say you know the discoverability no, the talk of Canadian creators is certain Canadian creators, powerful, privileged interests, as opposed to the little guy. Now, when they say, oh, we're going to make these more easily discovered and prominently displayed and promoted online, what they mean is that everything else gets pushed down. So this is itself a form of censorship. If you have the government saying, listen, uh, we know you have these things to say, but we are going to ensure that people can't hear them by preventing those things from being played to other people. That's fairly heavy involvement in sort of who can hear what ideas. Registration so that the Commission is informed of which online undertakings of this type are being carried on, at least in part in Canada, and can obtain contact information for those undertakings. So can is doing a lot of heavy lifting here, right? Because they're saying can obtain contact information. Well, let's be realistic. They're going to require that places like YouTube get this information. And this in and of itself is a form of censorship. When you think about the Federalist Papers, they were published under the name of Publius, which was a pseudonym. And that's because the people who were writing these things, which were you know, influential writings with respect to the American political discourse pre-Civil War, they didn't want their names to be known because what they were saying was perhaps not something the government would have appreciated. So <laughs> pseudonymous writing and anonymous writing is actually really important for freedom of speech because if you want to say things that are controversial, 
sometimes you don't want the government to punish you for that. And the most reliable way to ensure that the government can't punish you for that is by not telling them who you are. So this whole thing of saying you will obtain contact information is itself a form of discouraging certain forms of speech, controversial forms of speech. And you see here they're saying, oh, well, we're just going to be regulating, you know, the big companies, but we're going to be regulating the big companies by requiring them to get this information from the individual user. From the perspective of the individual user, it doesn't really matter who they're regulating. They can say, hey, user, you are required to put this information out there. That's one way. But it does it exactly the same if they say that the big company is required to get that information from you. Either way, you can't get your message out without going through this hoop. Uh, if we look at, come, uh, there's other countries that have very heavy censorship of the internet. And typically, the main backbone of that censorship is not going after individual users. It's going after ISPs and distributors of content and saying, here is what you must allow. Here is what you must block here. So the Great Firewall of China is not something that operates with respect to individual users. It's something that operates with respect to how ISPs manage their traffic, what things they block. This distinction of, hey, we're only going after the, you know, the big companies, not the users. No, they're going after the users too. It's just they're doing it through the big companies. They're just telling the big companies that they have to be the people to enforce those measures against their users. The provision of information and the auditing of records so that the commission has the information it needs for the purposes of supervising the Canadian broadcasting system and exercising the discretionary powers noted above. All right, so they're saying that they want to be able to go after these companies for their books, essentially. The Commission's power to regulate a social media service would not include program standards, for example, prohibited programming content, or the proportion of programs that must be Canadian. Yeah, except that if you're saying that, you know, the discoverability has to be elevated for Canadians, or rather, Canadians, those being those that can go through the bureaucratic hassles of being designated as Canadian content, you're basically saying that other stuff is going to be heard less. And when they say that we're going to get this information for the auditing of records, you better believe that one of the things they're going to ask is how much of the traffic from Canadians is going to Canadian, you know, content versus to other content. And if it's not high enough, oh, well, that's got to change. We've got to, you know, step up our discoverability. The other thing is they say it's not going to include program standards. Maybe that's the case now. Uh, We'll see. I have serious doubts that this is not opening the door to that in future. Uh, it's fairly clear. Uh, many of the statements that they've made indicate that that is something they want. They're just backpedaling away from it right this second. So right to freedom of expression, Section 2B of the Charter. As indicated in the Charter Statement, the bill's regulatory requirements have the potential to engage freedom of expression in Section 2B of the Charter. I don't think they have that potential. I think that they do engage that. The following considerations support the continued consistency of the proposed regulatory requirements with Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. By virtue of Clause 1, unaffiliated users of social media services would not be subject to broadcasting regulation in respect to the programs they post. Once again, it doesn't matter whether the government imposes these rules directly or forces YouTube to impose them. Either way, the users are the ones who end up wearing those restrictions. So, uh, the objectives of the bill in updating the Commission's regulatory powers and providing new powers applicable to online services remain. The bill maintains the Commission's role and flexibility in determining what, if any, regulatory requirements to impose on broadcasting undertakings, taking into account the Act's policy and regulatory objectives, and the variety of broadcasting undertakings subject to the Act. When they're talking about flexibility, this is not a great thing if you're talking about freedom of expression because that flexibility is always going to be more flexibility to cut into those rights. With respect to the proposal to give the Commission new limited powers in regulating an online undertaking that provides a social media service, in respect of programs posted by its unaffiliated users, the relevant charter considerations include the Commission's discretionary role and flexibility. Well, that is not what I want to hear as a lawyer or as a creator. 
because I want to hear that the commission is limited in ways that prevent them from treading on charter rights. Not saying, hey, listen, the commission is going to have to follow the charter because they should do that. That would be a good thing for them to do. Government organizations like this, government bureaucracies, quite often end up overstepping and stepping on various charter protected rights or various uh, procedural fairness rights. So this is not super, uh, super relieving. And in fact, this is the kind of notion that the Supreme Court has rejected in the criminal sphere. The case of the Queen and Nur, which is a firearm case addressing mandatory minimum sentences. One of the arguments that was put forward was, listen, uh, Crown prosecutors exercise discretion and police exercise discretion. Nobody would go ahead with this sort of discretionary mandatory minimum in a situation where it wasn't justified. And in fact, they couldn't show a situation where that had happened. However, the court said, no, you can't rely on discretion like this to save a bad provision. And I think that that is a really important finding that should be applied more more broadly. The discretion here doesn't, in my view, save this at all. In fact, it is the concern. The proposed narrowing of the commission's discretionary powers to regulate a social media service in respect of programs posted by its unaffiliated users to only the discrete matters outlined above is an additional consideration. I think it is, because if you have to narrow their powers in or, you know, to those discrete things, that kind of shows that you are actually stepping into very dangerous territory. It's stepping into the freedom of expression and free speech and just free communication and involvement in the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> you know, this the fact that you need to limit it shows the problem. And I have my serious doubts that it stays limited in any fashion. The commission is subject to the charter and must therefore exercise any discretionary powers it has in a manner that is consistent with the charter. The question is, will they? And the answer to that is a big maybe and probably not. The act provides that it must be interpreted and applied in a manner consistent with freedom of expression. As stated in the charter statement, in making regulatory decisions, the commission must proportionately balance the objectives of the act with the protection of freedom of expression in light of the facts and circumstances. So the question is, how is the government choosing which things should be shown to you on YouTube? That's what discoverability means. What things should YouTube show you as possible content you might be interested in? What things, you know, when you do a search for content, what things come up, what things don't come up? How is that properly something that can be balanced with freedom of expression? The government choosing what ideas you do and don't see. The Commission's decisions on matters of law or jurisdiction are subject to review by the Federal Court of Appeal. Well, I've talked about what it means to go to federal court before. It is incredibly expensive. It is incredibly onerous. This is not something that most people are going to be able to do. You know, if you're somebody who is posting your cat videos online, uh, you're not going to the Federal Court of Appeal to be able to criticize it if they push down your cat videos. Uh, a new creator, you know, there are creators who are earning big money. I'm not one of them. But, a, you know, a new creator who looks at this and says, do I want to go to the Federal Court of Appeal over this? They're almost certainly going to say no. Uh, in terms of the cost-benefit analysis, I couldn't justify going to the Federal Court of Appeal over this channel, notwithstanding the fact that I'm making some money on it. Because, oh man, the Federal Court of Appeal is very expensive. So saying, hey, you can go to the Federal Court of Appeal is really small comfort when we're talking about something that infringes the rights of sort of the ordinary small citizen. It's saying, hey, uh, you can spend $50,000 if you disagree with them. It's not sort of an unreasonable estimate of what it might cost to take something all the way through there. <sighs> you know, how many people are going to actually do that? Again, this is the sort of remedy that works really great if you happen to be a, you know, a producer of major motion pictures, you know, you're putting on TV shows, you're putting on movies, this kind of thing, and you've got a big budget, you've got a dedicated in-house legal team. You know, you're going to be able to get your material designated as Canadian content because you can handle those regulatory hurdles. You're also going to be able to fight it if you're being, you know, mistreated. 
But that's not the concern here. The concern here is what this is going to do to ordinary Canadian creators, the people who provide a voice of what actual ordinary Canadians are thinking, not what some movie studio is thinking. I'm just a random guy. I mean, I happen to be a lawyer, but I am just a random guy. And so, you know, this is my thoughts as a random member of the Canadian public. Somebody can say, hey, I, I like what Mr. Runkle says. I want to see more of that. Or they can say, nah, screw this guy. I don't want to talk to him or I don't want to hear from him and ignore that. But the government shouldn't be the one making the decision as to whether or not you see my content or you see the content of other Canadian creators. That's that's the big concern here. So this charter statement, in my in my view, doesn't solve the problem. In fact, in several places, it illustrates the problem. But this is a marketing piece. This is something that is designed to support the bill. It's something that, does, you know, it's promotion. So, of course, they're not going to say, hey, listen, our bill has deep and abiding flaws that, and should not proceed without correcting those. Because that's where it is. That that's the state of the uh, uh, that's the state of matters here this bill has deep and abiding flaws and should be tanked maybe start over at the drawing board and it's fairly clear when we see the defenses of it that the people defending this are people who don't have a whole lot of regard for canadians you know they've made statements like oh everyone who's opposed to this is some sort of militant extremist they've made comments about you know tinfoil hats They've made comments about how we're all uh, net neutrality extremists. Well, counting the people who have made public statements of support for net neutrality, Justin Trudeau, because net neutrality is overall a good idea. The idea that the viewer or consumer, you know, the end user should be the person who decides what they see and not the major companies. When, when they say we want you know, we don't like net neutrality, what they mean is we want to give major corporations more control all right so now the other issue is vpns because a lot of people have said hey i'll get a vpn this won't affect me and yes and no so let's say you get a vpn and one of the things that vpns can do is they can make it look like you're coming from a different location so you can appear to youtube to be an american user and at that point youtube is probably not going to be pushing canadian content onto you so you can avoid that the issue then where does that content come from? Because if this suppresses the small Canadian content producer, there's just not going to be much of that content available. People are going to stop, you know, presenting stuff. If I can't access the Canadian market of viewers because my Canadian content is not official Canadian content, so it gets suppressed, maybe I have to start talking about American law instead or something else. Uh, international issues to broaden my base because I at that point can't really reach out to Canadians I have a barrier the government is putting a wall between me and Canadians so you'll see fewer and fewer people you know small creators wanting to engage with Canadian topics with Canadian issues that's a big problem and your VPN won't save you from that because that affects the actual creators themselves it doesn't matter if you've got a great vpn if the content just doesn't exist anymore so the vpn might seem like a good short-term solution for getting around the government uh, sort of promotion there it's not going to solve the problem this is an existential threat for small canadian content creators and i'm one of the people who is in a somewhat luxury position I can walk away from this. This isn't my living. This is, you know, a side project. I do this largely because I enjoy it and I enjoy sharing legal topics with you, the viewer. But there's people for whom this is their livelihood and taking that away is going to affect them in a huge way. So as, as mentioned before, this is a big deal. Canadians should be upset by this. I encourage you to write your members of parliament or engage with them on social media. Let them know that you don't approve of this because it has tremendous potential to impact what things you see and hear as a Canadian, and particularly to suppress individual Canadian voices in favor of much larger interests. So if we're thinking about who we should be talking about defining Canadian culture, I feel it should be sort of the little guy. And we have tremendous potential with the current internet for the little guy to make their voices known. 
as opposed to the major companies, which is really who this bill is supporting and who it promotes. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to see more content. If C10 goes through, you might not see videos like this unless you're subscribed to them. Maybe not even then. So thank you. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters who help keep this channel going. At the $50 level, uh, Jason Elliott, Demo, Canada's National Farms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Ivo Nedev, the CCFR, BCAMF.org, Andrew Schaefer, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited and Mark olivier Demour. And at the $20 level, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Adam Meester. I also want to thank all of you at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.